Welcome to the Pit Podcast. I'm your host, Ray, the social media and PR manager of Pit Games. We're back for another episode of a new show to further show our support to the wider games and virtual reality industry. Last week, we chatted to Without Parole about the state of play, their upcoming VR Games Awards, our new alliance with Servius, and much more. Make sure to take the time to check that out if you haven't already. But this week, we're absolutely delighted to have Ian Higdon from Eurogamer and Platform32 with us today. How's it going, Ian? It's going good. Thank you so much for inviting me along, Ray. I guess you've got a lot of VGX prep going on at the moment, so I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. Yeah, no worries. It's it's a couple of uh, couple of weeks to go, but yeah, things are really getting a bit scary now. <laughs> I, it's always at this point when I'm like, oh no, I t- Totally haven't prepped as much as I should have done. Ooh, the week leading up to EGX is always a bit terrifying. Yeah. But we'll get there and it'll be fun once it's going. Yeah, definitely. And we've got some cool stuff to talk about BGX a bit later on, so uh, we'll get into that later. And as ever, we'll not only be covering what's happening in the world of Perp, answering your questions directly, but we'll also be taking a look at the wider world of VR and exploring how this emerging technology continues to grow. Before we get started, though, it's very important to note that not everything you hear about during today's show means we're in any way affiliated with these titles, companies, or individuals. Much like our role at the VR Game Showcase, we're exploring the wider possibilities helping to spread the word, offering a new platform for some of the week's breaking stories, and most importantly, facilitating some discussion and discussion we're going to have. So let's dive into the fun stuff. I'm also not affiliated with anything as well. (laughs) (laughs) So perhaps you heard the big news yesterday that Golem finally has a release date. I know this has been, this game has been in development for a long, long, long time, uh, but we have locked down a release date. It is confirmed starting November the 8th in European territories. North American territories are targeting a retail release date on or as close to that date as possible and the digital version of the game will follow on november the 12th is this a game that you've been looking forward to ian i mean well golem is a game that i i legitimately thought had just quietly been resigned to the scrap heap but wasn't it I'm, I'm pretty sure it was announced when psvr was first announced and we saw footage of it in the the b-roll clips of all different games mm. and then it just went quiet as far as as far as I'm aware, so yeah, this it, having a, an actual release date is quite exciting because it did look really promising. Mm. And uh, I remember thinking a month, a couple of months ago, oh, I wonder if that's just you know gone to the the big VR unreleased games uh, stable in the sky or whatever. But yeah, no, <laughs> I'm very very happy to hear it's coming out um, and being able to learn a bit more about it because uh, yeah, all I actually know about the game is that little brief glimpse that we saw a couple of years ago really yeah and it's 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 built by a team of industry veterans so you've got the music from marty o'donnell who's obviously the creator of the soundtrack for halo and destiny which is you know it's incredible sort of pedigree to have uh and then you've got the game design from jamie griesmere who's also the game designer on halo and destiny and so i mean there's an incredible pedigree of well a world-class pedigree of of developers on a playstation vr exclusive title i mean uh it's that in itself is quite exciting but we do know as well that the game is about twine who's an adventurous kid who's been left critically injured by a serious accident she can't leave her bed but she has this extraordinary ability to create and control large stone golems and see the world through their eyes so there's lots of exploring and ancient city and collecting history and artifacts to find so it's uh it's gonna be really really exciting so yeah that sounds awesome but um like yeah i literally i really don't have any idea how the game will even play at the moment like is it third person is it first person do you know so it's first person so it's kind of like a skyrim style in some ways basically you're exploring like an, an ancient city uh, there is actually combat and the game actually uses an innovative movement control scheme with one-to-one melee combat so essentially you're, you've, you've got a sword in hand and you're deflecting sword attacks from other golems and also you can feint and block and even counter-attack your enemies so that there's a real interesting melee combat system and a movement system incorporated for this which has actually been designed from the ground up for VR. Awesome, I'm going to have to uh, start researching that because that sounds really cool, something I'm definitely going to want to feature on Eurogamer at some point I think. Yeah, absolutely and it's it's just great that the game finally has released that I mean, I know so many people have been looking forward to it. It's, it's the game we get asked questions about all the time. When is Golan coming? What's <laughs> happening with Golan? What is going on? But so we're delighted that finally we can talk about it, get the release date out there. And it's it's actually, but it's soon, it's next month. Yeah. I mean, it's... <laughs> what, a, what a lovely surprise. Yeah. Who knew? Yeah. So, it's, I mean, obviously we saw it's state to play last week. A couple of games got an episode of PlayStation VR before the end of the year. This is yet another one to add to that list. So uh, PSVR is just going from strength to strength. So. Do you know what? I missed state of play. I should have been watching it but i was uh, on my way to oculus connect 6 so um you know while that was playing out i was uh, i was busy uh, being in the sky <laughs> <laughs> I've not had time. I've been so busy. I've not had time to really catch up with that. Well, just to give you a quick rundown, they had a game called Stardust Odyssey on there, which is a new IP that was an 
times at the show. Humanity, which is kind of like it's, it's a PlayStation VR compatible game. It's it's published by Enhanced to Tetris Effect. Nice. So that was kind of shown off there. Gorn also received a uh, release date as well. Yes. That's coming winter 2019 and that's been highly anticipated as well. So PlayStation VR's library is just, it's incredible. Yeah, I mean, PlayStation VR has one of, well, probably the best library, I'd say, for VR games at the moment. Um, having Gorn come to PSVR is awesome. Like, it's one that I've been really excited to, to finally play um, because I, I have a HTC Vive, but my controllers are broken. <laughs> so um, I, can't, I can't play it. But I've heard so many cool stories about Gorn. So yeah, finally, I'm going to be able to cut some heads off. It's going to be good fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty graphic trailer, actually. If I remember rightly, it was like I was thinking, "Wow, this is acceleration and violence compared to the, everything else they showed off in the, in the state of play." So yeah, but really, really cool. So Golem will be releasing from November the eighth. It's going to feature music, as mentioned, from award-winning composer Marty O'Donnell, the creator of the soundtrack for Halo and Destiny. And as an added bonus for fans, the physical edition of Golem will also include the downloadable version of Echoes of the First Dream, which is the musical prequel to the game. So Golem will launch physically as early as November the eighth as a PlayStation VR exclusive in Europe and North America, and the digital digital release comes on the 12th of November so more news on that in the coming weeks so we've also got something else to announce on the show as well there, there is no coincidence that Ian is with us on today's show because we're going to be talking a little bit egx uh, so we announced a couple of weeks ago that Angry Birds is going to be demoed at EGX we're going to be there all four days showing the game off to everyone who comes along we have some nice goodies to give away as well but we've also got a little added something extra to share with you today do you want to take it away Ian? Yeah sure so uh, every Sunday on uh, Eurogamer's YouTube channel I do a uh, a VR series called Ian's VR Corner and uh, this this EGX it uh, lands on a Sunday so I've decided to do a, a VR Corner live from EGX and uh, I'm not only really going to be playing Angry Birds VR under pressure on stage with uh, my colleagues Aoife and Zoe uh, but hopefully I'm going to be inviting some of you brave lot up to uh, play the game as well with us and anyone who does will uh, also get their hands on a box copy of Angry Birds VR 2 under pressure as well so uh yeah we're going to be playing it on stage uh it's going to be pretty crazy and you might also be able to walk away with your own copy if you're there in person and uh brave enough to mingle with us on stage that sounds really really exciting and uh, we also got some goodies to share with you as well so um any goodies that you'll be able to take away is not only include a box copy of the game but we also got some cool stuff like some snap bands we've got some posters all kinds of merchandise to share with you at the show as well so uh really 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 exciting stuff and uh i mean and you get the chance to meet ian right and and the rest of the <laughs> Game of Team, so I mean that. I mean, the, is the game's probably the better thing, but, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and you don't even have to be there in person to watch it as well. It will be streamed on our YouTube channel, uh, and that will be happening uh, between 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. on Sunday, the 20th of October. So uh, yeah, even if you're not there in person, you'll be able to see the chaos unfold uh, on stage from the comfort of your own home. That is fantastic news. Thanks for sharing that to us, Ian. And awesome. Going to move into some of the wider news this week now. So obviously we've had. Some two big announcements this week from our side but there's actually been a much bigger story this week as relates to Sony uh, and that relates to Sean Layden who was the veteran PlayStation executive been to Sony for 23 years has actually now moved on from Sony uh, this is a huge story because obviously Sean has been a face of uh, of PlayStation at E3s in the past he's taken a different role in, in recent months but uh, now he's completely separated from Sony entirely and it came from a tweet which which I think for me was the really surprising thing because you usually get real like major press releases of this but uh, really seemed to come out of nowhere didn't it? Yeah it was uh, it was a very odd one there was no build up or fanfare it was just like boop here's a tweet by Sean mm. so that obviously that sent I think the conspiracy theorists you know <laughs> off off on one um, I don't know if we've had a proper explanation or anything from Sean himself but um, it will definitely be sad to see him go because uh, he does was a bit of a champion of uh, PSVR as well so you know he's and he's had a, such a great legacy uh, with the company absolutely and I think I, I even saw tweets obviously a lot of people have reacted to the news and I think the developers of Concrete Genie which is actually coming out this month as a PlayStation VR exclusive they've said the game would literally not exist without Sean's support and as, as you've just rightly said he, he was such a big champion for PlayStation VR and you know all the wider releases as well so I mean this is it's, it makes things very interesting to see where Sony go for the future of PlayStation VR uh, we do know that it is backwards compatible 
compatible. The, the the current headset is backwards compatible PS5. But beyond that, I mean, who knows? I mean, mm. but it, it, well, Shuri Yoshida's always, you know, he's always retweeting PlayStation VR stuff and things. So they're definitely, I think, I don't think we're going to lose any love for PSVR from PlayStation over this. Hopefully, mm. Mm. but in terms of how the company is structured, you see that changes things as well. And I think a lot of people will say that these sorts of things are not necessarily a major surprise when you when, when you transition to a new generation or when you transition to the next major product then people do move on and as, as you mentioned Sean has been with PlayStation for 23 years maybe just you know wanted to change the scenery yeah. <laughs> but, I mean uh, who doesn't who doesn't uh, from time to time 23 years is a long time in one place that's longer than any job I've ever held down I'll tell you that <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean best of luck for whatever comes next for you but uh, very interesting story definitely we'll be watching that closely so following on from that Ian's been playing some different games this week as well uh, there's not necessarily been a major new release that's come out this week but uh, you've actually spent a bit of time preview an upcoming game excitingly you've actually been playing doctor who yes yes doctor who the edge of time uh, i went to the developer studios to get a uh, hands-on with that i played it on the rift s but it's coming out playstation vr and um i think the quest as well um coming out on quite a few platforms and uh yeah it was pretty good um i did a vr corner of it so there's like a 10 15 minute let's play of the level i played in there uh, there was a couple of surprising things in there the first one was that um it's actually quite scary you know i i haven't watched doctor who for a very long time not since i was a little kid and i remember doctor who being quite scary um yep. back in the day dalek and cybermen and stuff freaking me out um and this level i played was set in a spooky dark forest on an alien world and uh, there was a great use of like 3d sound to make you hear like rustling in bushes and things like kind of following you around this alien world and then occasionally these weird like kind of dog-like creatures with red faces that run out in front of you like for a bit of a jump scare so um it felt a bit like playing a Blair Witch game in VR uh, which was weird because I had a sonic screwdriver in my hand but you know that was pretty good uh, there's going to be loads of different types of levels it's not going to just be that horror uh, aspect there was um a level that I couldn't record had some really cool physical problem solving some escape room type stuff that was to do with bouncing lasers around a room but there is going to be a level with the famous weeping angels in which oh. a lot of people have said uh, the most terrifying thing ever and a few people in the comments of my video said well I'm not going to be able to play that game if the weeping angels are in there <laughs> because they uh, they scare me so much so uh, yeah that should be good fun uh, watching people get scared on that I'm definitely going to play it through but um, the other thing that did strike me with this game it was that it's very very dark um, I don't know whether recent Doctor Who's visually have been given like a, a dark kind of almost monotone colour scheme but this game is very one note in colour the first level I played was set in a London alleyway and you have to um, you have to make a temporary radar dish to call in the TARDIS while a, uh, a Dalek spaceship is flying overhead and everything was just it was just red different shades of dark red really which made it kind of hard to find props around and if you watch the video on Ian's VR corner the uh, the forest level it starts off just shades of brown then a weird time um, mishap happens and everything gets really dark and then it's just like dark blues uh, so I don't know I was my memory of Doctor Who is a little bit weird a little bit more psychedelic back in the Sylvester McCoy days things were a bit more colorful and stuff so I don't know I I, I was just it was very dark and mm. a, a little bit visually dull so I, I I don't know whether that's true of the TV series nowadays who knows but uh, you know it had uh, Jodie Whittaker's voice in there and the TARDIS was photogrammetry it's done I think it's photogrammetry basically they got it used the exact prop and they scanned it in same with the um, the sonic screwdriver so any Doctor Who fan is going to be like super pumped with how authentic it is especially uh, the bit when you go inside the TARDIS and you can pilot it so oh. I think maybe Doctor Who fans are going to really really enjoy it and then casual VR players or people who don't know Doctor Who too much uh, I think maybe they're not going to be as keen on it but we'll see we'll see i've only played uh about 20 minutes 
20, 30 minutes of it, and it's a three-hour game. So. Right. It sounds like it's a nice mix of horror and puzzle solving as well. I, mean, I think you find with a lot of VR games, there's either one or the other. They don't necessarily combine as much as perhaps they should. Um, but it sounds like it not only captures the spirit of, of what Doctor Who is like, you said, you've got Jodie Whittaker's voice in there, and you've got the, you can control the TARDIS, and mm-hmm. the Weeping Angels have been mentioned as well. But I mean, it sounds like you've also got that kind of dimension of the, the Doctor Who puzzle solving, how the Doctor gets through one scenario to the next, and also the kind of the, 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 there are degrees of horror in there as well as you mentioned there are the, the lots of the, the, the creatures and uh, and the beings that are in there are very terrifying and then yeah and it's uh, it's written by um it's written by a, a writer who's written episodes of doctor who mm. uh, there there are daleks in there and they're voiced by the the guy who voices the daleks Mm. So, you know, along with the puzzle solving and the horror, uh, there is this like heroic um, amount of authenticity uh, in there for Doctor Who fans. So it's a gr- a, a great companion piece for anyone who is a, a Doctor Who fan, for sure. Sounds brilliant. Well, I'm really looking forward to checking that out. I'm actually, I can't say I've, I've like you, I haven't watched much of the of the new Doctor Who stuff, but certainly I've, I've captured enough that, uh, you know, I've got a good feel for the series now. I've not watched it since Sylvester McCoy and Ace were uh, <laughs> battling against the candy man who was a giant dude made out of licorice all sorts so you know <laughs> that was my frame of reference <laughs> not the one you have to say five times and he appears in the mirror behind you not that candy not man. that guy thankfully not- no <laughs> thankfully yeah. oh, that sounds really cool thanks for sharing it with that ian that sounds really that definitely sounds like something i want to play for sure cool so yeah I guess look, we, we, now we've got you with us I mean people have, have really jumped in with a lot of questions we want to ask you but we've got a couple of questions we wanted to ask you as well sure. and just sort of get an idea of how you got into the industry and kind of what you do at the moment and uh, what yeah, you know, yeah what, definitely. What, what it's led you to and what you kind of see your future growing into in the next sort of five to ten years well uh, <laughs> God, it's been, it's been a really weird way of getting into games jour- journalism me a lot of people they'll do games journalism or journalism courses and stuff but I've actually got a uh, broad broadcast TV background. I used to work in shopping TV. I worked my way up from floor manager to camera operator. And then in the end, I was a uh, vision mixer director leading a team of about eight people. And I was doing live TV shows there. And it was, um, it was, it, I really enjoyed it. It was a really cool job. And it was a seven day fortnight structure. So it was two days on, two days off, three days on. So I'd work Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Then I'd have two days off, two days on and three days off. Wow. So that <laughs> afforded me a lot of spare time. Uh, and during that spare time, I started doing YouTube videos about video games with some pals and uh, just uh, stretching my video editing skills and whatnot uh, on, on YouTube. And it just started off as a bit of a hobby. And then a guy that was a producer uh, at the TV show I worked at, uh, Gems TV, he left and he got a job as a, um, a producer on an entertainment news program, uh, which was on like... Uh, that it was like right off in the distant ends of UK Freeview. It was like a tiny channel that no one ever watched. Channel 99742. <laughs> yeah, I think it was 99743, even further up. Um, and yeah, they did like music, they did films, they did theatre, and they were like, oh, we should probably do video games as well. And my mate was like, oh, I know a guy. Um, and so they asked me if I wanted to do some stuff on... Um, on this TV show. So I was like, of course, yeah, I did. Um, and so every week I'd review a game and I'd send the, re- I'd edit the review, send it in, they'd edit it into this TV show. And through that, I got to get invites to press events and things like that. So I'd go and do previews of games and chat to uh, the PR and the developers and other games journalists. And I started networking and getting myself known in the video games industry that way. And after about two years of doing that and growing Platform 32 as a uh, YouTube channel, I was approached by Eurogamer who were looking for a YouTube uh, editor. Uh, They had a YouTube channel, but it had fallen by the wayside and hadn't had anything done with it for about a year. And and they asked me if I wanted to come on full time and basically do what I was doing for Platform 32 in my spare time uh, as a hobby, as a job. And I was like, oh, hell yeah, I do. <laughs> so, so, yeah, about seven years ago now, I, th- I think it's my seven year anniversary in December wow. for Eurogamer. Um, about seven years ago, I packed up my job in TV and uh, started working for Eurogamer full time. Uh, for two years, it was just me doing videos uh, on my 
own. It was I, I was contracted oh, to do five videos a week, so that was Monday to Friday, which uh, was uh, absolutely knackering. But <laughs> I bet, yeah, I bet. but uh, having edited videos, I can, I can see <laughs> <laughs> it was it was very tiring. I I used sometimes when I was falling behind. I I do a lot of live streams basically because they're kind of quite easy content to do and fill up spots. Um, but because it was kind of like my my passion, I didn't mind doing extra hours uh, and just doing it all. But after about two years, um, they decided to get some extra people in. So hey. first, Aoife Wilson joined. Uh, she came in from Jinx TV, I think. Then there was Johnny Chiardini. He was ex GameSpot, and then Chris Bratt joined. He was ex VG Twenty Four Seven, and then we became Team Eurogamer. Um, <laughs> And, uh, yeah, since then, Johnny's gone off to do his own, um, well, not his own, but he's gone to launch a, uh, a Dice Breaker, which is a board game YouTube channel. And I think they're bringing out a companion website Fantastic. soon. Chris Bratt's gone off and done his own, uh, Patreon called People Make Games, which is doing really well. Um, so Ethan and I have, uh, are still there though. And we've been joined by, uh, Zoe Delahunty Light, who came from Games Radar. And, uh, we're just having the most amount of fun at the moment. Like, we, we're having a really good time um it's it's a very fun job to have it can be tiring mm. uh but you know I, I every day i wake up and i i count my blessings that i'm 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 doing my hobby and my passion as a job yeah it's it's beautiful i mean i've, I've seen a lot of the content you put out i mean ian and, and and the team don't just do vr of course they do a lot of other stuff and i've actually watched your uh your late to the party videos which are great it's actually oh, nice. to, to really kind of go back and play games that people might have forgotten about or haven't played before and uh it, it, mm. it's re- really really cool stuff you're doing and uh obviously Obviously, you get to go to EGX as well and, and interact with the fans as well, which I guess is a really exciting part for you. Yeah, that that's so good. I mean, being on the internet yourself, you'll know that the comments on the internet can sometimes be a little bit um, uh, cr- <laughs> cruel. Yeah, sometimes they can be a bit cruel. Thankfully, our, our fans uh, and the people that watch, uh, the majority are really nice. Uh, but, you know, there's occasionally uh, the anonymous people who'll uh, leave something nasty. And I, I've been around for quite a while now it washes off me a bit but it does get to some people um the the cruelty of youtube comments and the abruptness of people mm. um who have a bit of anonymity so i love going to ejects and actually meeting the people who actually really appreciate our videos in person because it takes two seconds for someone who's you know not very nice to leave a shawty comment and then (laughs) move on to Mm. the next thing but the people who really the people we make our videos for the people who appreciate our content and the people we appreciate the people that come along to egx queue up to meet us at the meet and greets or sit down and watch us perform live in the shows they're the ones they're always so sweet they love to share their stories with us i get so many people coming up to me talking about their experiences with vr um so yeah it's just sometimes you get a little bit deadened on the inside when you work on the internet and to whenever i go to egx i always come back with such like a big heart because i'm just like hmm. i'm just so happy to have met all the people that um the nice people yeah the, you know um the true fans it's, yeah it's great the, the true fans it, it's it's a wonderful wonderful thing and and it's also great because there's a huge community um that watch Eurogamer and uh, platform 32 and they always meet up and they hang out with each other and stuff so it's really nice to see um friendships blossom there and the occasional romance as well we've had between viewers which is very nice so you know it's cool it's lovely it's uh it's it's lovely yeah i I also noticed as well that talking about the amazingness of fans like you actually had a group of fans band together to buy an oculus quest is that is that right that is that is uh very right i mean yeah, I was, uh, I was very shocked. I mean, it's, uh, I was a bit kind of taken aback. I was like, are you sure you could, <laughs> you could spend that money on yourselves? You don't, you really don't have to, but, um, no, they, they really wanted to. And so I was like, okay. Um, and it has, it's enabled me to cover more games now on Ian's VR corner. Uh, you know, I wasn't able to cover quest games now, uh, before, and now I've done four or five videos on them. So yeah, very, mm. 
uh, very appreciative of that. It's um, helped, yeah, it's helped expand the VR show and just my love of VR as well. And I think that's a really interesting thing because obviously your your, uh, your your love of VR has actually got a lot of people into VR and I think a lot of people have, have kind of learned about VR and, and the beauty of it through your videos. Uh, and I guess that a lot of people have kind of wanted to reward that and kind of wanted to see you cover other games and cover other formats. But I guess that's really uh, something I really want to know is that what obviously you're a gamer, one of the, the biggest sites out there at the moment that are actively covering VR on a weekly basis. I mean, VR is still really mm. struggling to crack that mainstream. Um, and I guess what kind of led you to be in the, the, the driving force for that and, and, and almost the face of VR for Eurogamer? Well, I tell you what, Eurogamer is the best place I've ever worked. It's such a great company. And one of the things that I admire the most about Eurogamer is the fact that they let us follow our passions. The reason why big companies don't cover or big media companies don't cover VR very much is because the clicks aren't there. I know this for sure, like the VR videos are often some of the lowest performing of the ones on our site. The articles I write, they get read by the hardcore, but they're kind of skipped over by everyone else. VR has this like dedicated fan base, but it's yet to have a, uh, you know, um, it's yet to be picked up by the mainstream. So um, while most companies, I think, would have been like, uh, you know, Ian, this isn't working. We're not getting the views. Can you move on? Uh, Eurogamer are very happy to let me carry on uh, with it just because um, I'm so passionate about it. And I want Eurogamer to be a place where the mainstream can go to learn about VR. It's it's baby steps. It's taken a long time. We get a lot of people in the comments who say, oh, you need to cover more VR. But um, really, uh, I don't have time to do lots of VR coverage and my everyday video coverage job as well. So it's it's um, one of those things where I'm just I'm slowly trying to make a difference from my end, and Eurogamer uh, are, mm. are being supportive of that at the moment. Um, and I just I just hope that having this platform that's a little bit wider reaching than say standard hobbyists, uh, I'm just hoping that using that will help to grow people's knowledge and love of VR in general. No, I agree. And I feel like, as you say, with, with you're in a great position at the moment because we've obviously there's a new generation coming. There's going to be more and more support for PlayStation VR and VR in general in the next few years. And I feel like Eurogamers really position themselves as, as, a, as, a, as a major sort of hub for, for VR coverage. Uh, and obviously you are leading the way in that in, in many ways. Uh, obviously, we, we work with many, many different media partners. We work with a lot of press, but we've generally noticed how, on our experiences of, of trying to get VR games covered and to, to spread those to to, to, to different outlets is that Eurogamer has always been at the forefront of that and so it's really refreshing to see your passion about it and that Eurogamer are willing to allow you to to, to express yourself and to, to, to you know to demonstrate as much VR as possible you get to go to OC6 yeah, you, know, yeah. you get to play Doctor Who it's it's incredible yeah and, uh, I mean these kind of these kind of opportunities have only come about because I've been pushing VR coverage on the site uh, and on our YouTube channel and like you said you know we've got we're on the cusp of a new generation i mean if i can already have my feet on the ground and running when it comes to the new generation uh then you know that's only going to help euro gamers you know figures or, or clicks when uh you know when there's news of psvr2 or whatever it's going to be called uh if there <laughs> yeah. even is a psvr2 yeah i'm hoping so Me too. but uh you know when the <laughs> yeah. when there's news of something like that dropping there's going to be people that know that hopefully they trust my judgment and they trust my critical analysis of things like that, uh, that they will say, hey, let's go and see what the, those lot over at Eurogamer think about all this new stuff. So, you know, yeah. I'm hopefully future-proofing myself is what I'm trying to say in a, <laughs> a long-winded way. Absolutely. I completely got what you meant there. And um, as I say, you've introduced a lot of people to the medium for, for your videos and, and for the Eurogamer platform. And it's just, it's great to see, you know, the, the, the work you're doing. And, and obviously as well, like demoing major PlayStation VR games on stage at EGX. It's, you know, it's, it's steps like 
like that are just leading to more and more awareness about spreading word about the medium. So it's, it's amazing work you're doing. Cool, thanks. Um, well, yeah, I suppose like I've asked you enough questions now, so I put you on the spot enough and we, we've we've allowed people to ask you some questions as well. So if you're good to ask, answer some more questions, Ian, uh, we've got a few here from, uh, from, from your fan base. Sure. So I guess we'll go to the first one from Kahuna, who says, what is the biggest roadblock for VR in your opinion? We sort of covered this a little bit, but we'll kind of get a bit deeper dive into it. Mm. Uh, it's sort of in terms of widespread adoption and more gains, etc. What, what do you think is the biggest roadblock? I think, to be honest, I think the biggest roadblock for VR is the fact that there are a lot of roadblocks. <laughs> um, it's not as easy as sitting down in front of your console, picking up a controller and pressing start. You've got a selection of headsets that you can choose from. You've got tethered and untethered. You need space to do it. You need um, a good PC if you're using a, a, a tethered one. Uh, you need a budget and you also need to convince people to try VR. I think in the early days of VR, when it first came out, a lot of people tried it and VR wasn't as good then as it is now. Um, and I think a lot of people who tried it at events and stuff may have, there was instances of some people feeling maybe motion sick or something. And a lot of mm. that got picked up in the press. Oh, VR makes you feel sick and stuff like that. And that kind of permeated through potential consumers more than the fact that VR is incredible fun. Lots of people are a bit like worried uh, that it'll make them feel sick um, and unless people actually try VR for themselves uh, they won't know for definite I've heard a, a lot of people say oh, I'm just I've just not bothered playing it in case it makes me feel sick but there's so many nowadays there's so many stationary experiences and experiences that won't make you feel ill like when uh, when EGX first promoted PSVR they had on the stands rigs and Getaway Heist, which are both uh, high motion games, which you know, rigs especially is going to turn anyone's stomach if it's their first time playing. Definitely. But now you've got things like uh, Beat Saber that I put my mum in and she was instantly able to play it because you just stood still. Uh, there's, you know, absolutely no motion sickness there. You've got things like Astro Bot and Moss on PlayStation VR, which are absolutely gorgeous. Mm. Uh, almost, you know, Disney-esque or Nintendo-esque style of presentation uh, that again is quite an easy experience mm. so i think um for people who haven't tried vr yet the only thing i could say to them is just try it <laughs> if you have a friend who has vr go and ask them what the nice ge most gentlest piece of vr there is to play or go to an event like egx and play just a nice gentle uh, vr game yeah. what one thing i can't do with my articles and videos is give you a good idea of what it's like to be inside the headset the flat images and the text yeah. no matter how much I say in words wowzers the scale of this is amazing you just can't comprehend it until you're actually inside the helmet so yeah loads of roadblocks uh, one of them is just I think people just getting people to overcome their fears of trying VR and getting them in a headset to try it yeah no I think you hit the nail on the head right there with how you, how it's covered in the media it, it definitely feels like it's a medium that supports video perhaps more than text uh, but then at the same time text can go deeper in some ways where, where video can't because you can kind of explore the dimensions potentially more where video just kind of shows you a visual representation of what you are seeing yeah. rather than kind of like having the headset strapped to you and actually getting being immersed in that world right um and, and i feel like we, we actually recently demoed moss to uh to someone who'd, uh, who'd never played vr and <laughs> like and, and it was the perfect experience because they were they were waving at the mouse they were kind of just looking around they barely touched the controller for about five minutes because they yeah. were just looking and exploring it and just taking it all in um and i think that's that's the beauty of vr it's like not just, obviously you want to play a game and have a good experience on that but i feel like for some people it's just that immersion they just want to kind of feel and be part of a world and try something different in games yeah they definitely do um one of my ex-colleagues bendix uh, she was she was quite scared of trying vr because uh, she thought it was going to make her feel sick and actually on an episode of late to the party i um i introduced her to moss and uh, at points she was squeeing so hard she was nearly in tears with the cuteness of quill and mm. how amazing her animations were and stuff and then like now she's like next time i come and visit you i've got to play more of moss nice. so you know it's it's just one of those things you just got to be you got to play the right thing in the right setting and um it will 
change your opinion of the medium if you've never played it before, I think. Yeah, I think you're right there. Uh, so we've got another question now from Jens Merckx, who says, sausages? Sausages? Uh, I can't I can't <laughs> believe it's taken this long for us to say sausages. <laughs> <laughs> the, the story behind that, for people who don't know, is I'm incredibly bad with mouse and keyboard. And back in the days when we streamed a lot of PUBG for Eurogamer, people said I had big sausage fingers so I couldn't aim. Probably <laughs> so then it was sausage aim. And then I, I and then now I do str- I, I still stream PUBG on platform 32 with my friends and we call ourselves the sausage squad because we're all <laughs> sausage aim we have more fun chatting than we do killing in PUBG but yeah that's the sauce that, that's why sausages is a thing <laughs> <laughs> James Burks actually does ask a yep. question though. <laughs> <laughs> they say, <laughs> said which VR kit would you recommend to get started I thought it might be economical not the system itself but that most people can't afford the room to set up a VR system well that is a tricky question um, I think for a beginner it's going to either be the Oculus Quest or the PlayStation VR. Um, PlayStation VR, you do need a bit of room because of the camera, uh, especially if you're going to use Move controllers or the Aim controller, which is a fantastic piece of kit. But it has a much, like, one of the biggest libraries on there. There's so much choice and some amazing games on there. Like I said, uh, Moss, um, Beat Saber's on there. Firewall Zero Hour is an incredible multiplayer game played with the Aim controller, especially. I, just, I love that game. It's like Rainbow Six C in VR yeah. uh, so if you want like a great selection of games and I don't think it's you can get like um, you can get it kind of cheap in sales now especially like Black Friday things and stuff like that you can get some good bundles with it so if you want a big library of really cool games um, uh, that you can especially if you've got a PlayStation 4 already then that's pretty good as a plug and play thing but if you don't have much space I would heavily recommend the Oculus quest because you can take that wherever you want i often go downstairs move my coffee table out of the way and then i have this big living room area to play um vader immortal in and stuff like that uh and um it's the library on that isn't that big at the moment but you've got you know beat saber on there which is just phenomenal anyway uh and with the upcoming oculus link which will let you play Rift games on the Quest. You know, you're gonna, it's gonna double or triple the available library mm-hmm. uh, for that. So, yeah, I'd say depending on your space, Quest or the PSVR is the way to go at the moment. Yeah, I think Quest is, Quest has just changed the game, hasn't it, in terms of being wireless mm. and you no, know, in terms of just literally just being able to stick a headset. I mean, you've obviously seen the funny images and pe- videos of people just playing VR on when they're waiting for the the petrol to fill up in their car, or yeah. waiting in the middle of a traffic jam, or just being still in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you know, it, it's changed the game. Like you can literally pick up and play VR wherever you are in the world. It's incredible. Yeah, it was um, funny at Oculus Connect Six, um, walking through the corridors, and occasionally you just walk past some some person just stood there in the middle of everyone just playing on an <laughs> Oculus Quest just having a lovely time in amongst a crowd of hundreds so yeah uh, you know it's yeah. very cool uh, but yeah the, um, the the link news was very exciting for me because it means I'll be able to cover some Rift S games as well in the future yeah, now definitely and well as you say it doubles the library uh, almost immediately uh, mm. and then goodness knows what other games are in development for quests in the in, in the next 12 to 18 months so yeah yeah incredible so uh, yeah good good call on that definitely uh, we're just gonna have two more for you as well so uh, Colonel Big Beard asked many many questions but I think we'll just narrow it down to the one okay uh, <laughs> what's been the best overall game experience so far you've tried in VR well my most memorable experience the one that made me go right this is a game changer i'm sticking with this is was resident evil 7 in vr Mm -hmm. um i was blown away by the visuals um i did three four hour live streams where i just played through the entire game i've never felt a sense of presence and of being in a I have since, but at that point, I'd never felt like I was that immersed in a game before. I have like memories of playing that game and being in areas of that game that are like memories I had when I went on holiday with my family. The, the, the locations seemed that real, uh, for me. So that was like, that was an ultra game changer for me. Yeah. Um, but, and I've got to bring up Beat Saber again because that's just something I bring out at parties all the time. It's so easy to play. Mm. It's something that I always try and introduce um, people to uh, in VR. So yeah, it's, it's a mix between those, but I've got so many, I've had so many good experiences with different types of games. I think it's amazing as well when you mentioned Beat Saber and also we've got Box VR coming out in a couple of weeks, but uh, how people have actually used that for fitness regimes as well and actually they've, they've 
have lost so much weight by playing Beat Saber and have lost so much weight by playing Box VR because I think Connect was kind of introducing that method a little bit and even the Wii with the Wii Remote and mm. with VR I mean it, it's 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 so much more physical because you've got full freedom of movement and uh, like with, with Beat Saber it gets really really intense mm. uh, well I've uh, yeah I do get a little bit um, tired out with Beat Saber but I'm I'm a bit too lazy to work up a sweat but I've actually I've never actually played a fitness game in VR I'm always I've always been a little bit like oh will it you know steam up the eyepieces or is it gonna <laughs> how do they work you know so I might I would be interested in trying something yeah. like that out yeah well it's to say it's it's it, it, it's an interesting way that it's that the medium again is is uh, tackling something different I mean obviously we've had fitness in games before but certainly I feel with VR there's there's the opportunity there to to really take that to the next level so uh, mm. yeah it's really exciting uh, and I suppose the last question is from that guy's will who asked what do you enjoy most when creating Ian's VR corner and what has kept you going for over 70 episodes <laughs> well uh, god uh, well what do I enjoy the most I like playing just experiencing all the different VR games that's for sure I, I, if you've watched an Ian's VR corner video ever you'll know that I have a bit of I, I, I try and be I try and give a good idea of how the game will play but I'm also quite silly about it when I do it I'll sing a lot of songs I'll do stupid stuff I'll try and bully NPCs or balance things on their heads um, or in the case of Groundhog Day I balanced a, a magazine on top of my morning wood which was uh, a bit of a bit of a surprise when I found out I could do that in the, the Groundhog Day game uh, so yeah I just you know I like to just show off how different an experience you can have with VR. Flat games are fine, you know, you can have lovely different experiences with those games, but VR allows so much more exper uh, experimentation, whether that's on the part of the developers or the part of the player just experimenting in the environments. And um, yeah, I just, I just enjoy trying out these new experiences being taken to different worlds and then uh, hopefully inspiring other people to to take the dive and get in a helmet and see what's going on uh, you know for themselves yeah, definitely as you say as we were talking about earlier that the difference between video really sort of it only goes so far and trying to show you what VR can do and that you really do have to experience it for yourself to, to get a real feel for what is going on but I think what you do by, by introducing the silliness and kind of like the, the way you uh, you know tr try to show what can be done it gives people perhaps a better perspective than you know mm. th than if they just watch the straight let's play of, of a game <laughs> yeah well yeah hopefully hopefully and of course um, I'm not 100% what we have on show at EGX this year but every other year we have had quite a big PSVR presence so if you're listening to this and you still haven't played VR um, and you are coming to EGX take a bit of time to come along and do just try something out ask the uh, people at the stands um, who are uh, who were very knowledgeable about everything what the most gentle experience is um, I, I know Angry Birds VR that's that's pretty stationary right yeah they could come yeah, along absolutely. and chat to you guys and uh, try yeah. that um, so you know get in there stick your head in a helmet and see what it's like if you like overcooked it's <laughs> overcooked in VR so there you go overcooked in VR well we love overcooked uh, uh, here at Eurogamer so yeah I'm definitely looking forward to taking it for a spin on stage well that's going to do it for today's show thank you so much for tuning in we hope you enjoyed this latest edition of the Perpcast a massive massive thank you to our special guest Ian Higdon for joining us here today we really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to come and speak to us uh, tell us where tell everyone where they can find you Ian and what's going on with you next so my Twitter is at Ian Higdon and I tweet out there about all of um my uh, videos whether they're on uh, youtube.com forward slash Eurogamer or youtube.com forward slash platform 32 uh, Eurogamer is where we do all the let's plays previews and uh, list videos and stuff like that and then platform 32 is where I, I stream VR games and stream battle royale games and just you know dick around with my friends so it's a little bit more casual than the Eurogamer stuff <laughs> uh, so you, yeah you can check out um, all my VR coverage on both those things Ian's VR Corner is every Sunday about 2 p.m. on uh, Eurogamer's YouTube channel and I tend to stream at least one VR game per week on uh, on Platform 32 uh, but yeah coming 
up uh i'm not too sure past egx that's just coming at me with full beam headlights on at the moment so <laughs> once that's out of the way i'll have a clearer idea of what's going on but november's coming up big game release time so uh, it's gonna it's gonna be exciting and busy it is yeah definitely and i say definitely come along to egx come and check out ian on stage with the eurogamer team as well and uh don't forget angry birds on stage on sunday get down there get down and play and win some goodies yeah because that that sounds like a plan <laughs> to me so <laughs> if you want any of your questions answered during a future show reply in the comments section below or send us a message on your preferred social platform and we'll do our best to answer them you could even win yourself some goodies what would you like to see in future pipcasts sound up below in the comment section as we're looking to make this a show that's informative and interesting to you as possible you can find pip games on facebook tweet us at pip games subscribe on youtube using the link in the description below you can also find us on discord instagram linkedin and get all the latest news on our products on pipgames.com thanks for listening and we'll see you next time